Well, hello everybody, and we are continuing with Esoteric Astrology Adventure number 55. <clears throat> I'm making up for a lost recording. As you know, I did a two-hour recording, but uh, with the microphone on mute, which is really the intelligent thing to do. It was very lively, as I say, a, a silent movie. <laughs> anyway, here we are. Uh, on page 127 of the book, we're still in the Pisces chapter, and uh, we are working with the idea that uh, Jupiter and Mercury are the two exoteric rulers of Pisces, but that there is a type of um, explicit type of inference that occurs with respect to the esoteric planets of the mutable cross. and. We are now about to undertake the study of their particular influence. DK says, they embody the recognitions and the reactions which condition man's consciousness when he is preparing to transfer off the mutable cross and mount the fixed cross. So basically I was saying something rather important that we do not have to wait to um, find ourselves uh, crucified upon the fixed cross in order to experience the effect of the esoteric rulers of the mutable cross. They are used for the advanced man who is a probationary disciple before the first initiation. They are um, used to help him uh, begin to develop a group uh, consciousness, uh, the emphasis upon mind, we will see why they are so necessary immediately before mounting the fixed cross. Um, so we are experiencing these influences uh, at the latter stage of the path of probation as we begin to enter the kingdom of God at the first initiation and become true disciples. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, to a certain extent, uh, we also begin to experience the uh, growing influence of the rulers of the fixed cross at that time as well. <coughs> but certainly not the full experience. And later we will discuss the manner in which the rulers of the fixed cross have to dominate the esoteric rulers of the mutable cross, uh, combining with them and drawing forth from them increased potentials. This is a very interesting idea, and it has to do with the power of combination. Okay. Right, and that's where I had ended my ill-fated, <laughs> ill-fated part one. <laughs> no sound. Oh, goodness. I hope that doesn't happen again. One has to make these mistakes with every little part of the GoToWebinar program. You know, no sound, no picture, ill coordination, you know, all these different things uh, occur until we finally uh, hit our stride. And even then, one has to be extremely watchful. And watch out when you're doing these webinars on uh, a Mercury retrograde. Of course, it's not retrograde now, but the moon was in Taurus, which has everything to do with sound and its propagation. Well, uh, for my wife who listened to the webinar, the sound was propagated just fine, but she wasn't recording. I was, and my computer was on mute. <laughs> All right, onward. <clears throat> uh, so, yes, we're now looking at the esoteric rulers of the mutable cross as transitional energies to help us mount the fixed cross, sensitivity to them appear not in the early days of the immutable cross at all, because those days require millions of years, but rather sensitivity to them uh, occurs in the very later days of the mutable cross when we're already making that transition. You know, just the way there's no cut and dried exact entry into a sign. DK tells us about this, and I would say it would apply to a house. Um, you, there being, let's say, two and a half degrees on either side where the influences of the two signs are sort of cuspal and blend and merge. So I would say there is no ex exact, precise, uh, cut and dried point of transition at which the, um, the exoteric planets uh, 
no longer are operative, the esoteric planets begin immediately, uh, or even uh, that the influences of the mutable cross suddenly terminate and the influences of the fixed cross suddenly begin. No, that's not the way it is. And so many of us are in these stages of transition or overlap. And it's difficult, uh, even as it is now in this transitional period between Pisces and Aquarius, to get our energy straight and to see exactly that to which we are responding, as we probably are responding to a mixture of both energies and to the influence of each of the energies upon the other. So we're in a rather fluid and semi-confused uh, time in terms of uh, humanity's transition towards the age of Aquarius. And when we are moving on to the path of discipleship, the true discipleship at the first initiation, it's all also a rather fluid and somewhat ambiguous time with the energies of the mutable cross pulling backwards, the energies of the fixed cross pulling forwards. So we are, let's see, operating, the word is through, through. So let us see what happens. Yes, he comes, therefore, through Venus, under the power of mind, transmuted into wisdom through the instrumentality of love. This is Venus as the ruler of Gemini. Uh, Venus is particularly the planet of the soul, and it must become stronger and stronger as we uh, move towards mounting the fixed cross, because the fixed cross is the uh, cross of the unfoldment of the soul. So we come under the power of the mind, the increasingly illumined mind, not so much just the concrete mind, but more the son of mind, more mind as it functions on the higher mental plane, or at least infuses the concrete mind with those higher mental powers. We come through Venus under the power of the mind, which is transmuted into wisdom. Let uh, wisdom take the place of knowledge in my life. This is Meditation 4 from the Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 2, Meditations. A very powerful meditation, and this is the second verse of that meditation, which has to do with the transmutation of knowledge into wisdom. Well, how is knowledge, uh, or the mind, uh, transmuted into wisdom? And it is through appreciation and love. This is one of the main means of transmutation. Purification, transmutation, and uh, the energy of love. When we deeply appreciate the place, the context, the purpose of the knowledge we are acquiring, and we understand its relations to other factors of knowledge, then we can begin to know how to use that knowledge wisely, lovingly, in relation to the plan. I mean, knowledge is knowledge. It can be used in any way, but it's not wisdom unless there is a loving appreciation of the value of that knowledge to the divine plan. So otherwise, the same piece of knowledge can be used in a negative manner. So we, we apply love and appreciation to that about which we know, and increasingly our relationship to that about which we know becomes wise, increasingly wise. So uh, we, he comes, therefore, uh, under the power of Venus, under the power of mind, through Venus, under the power of mind, transmuted into wisdom, because Venus is a planet of love, wisdom particularly, just as Jupiter is. They are the two benefic planets. They have a lot to do with the second ray, and uh, Venus, uh, uh, monadically, uh, very essentially so. So it is um, uh, mind and mind and heart. Uh, Jupiter united mind and heart. Venus does the same. Uh, Jupiter through expansion and uh, Venus through the uh, power of uh, the beauty of attraction. Uh, Jupiter relates to archetypes on the monadic plane, and Venus relates to archetypes on the plane of higher mind, soul archetypes. Jupiter is essentially a more advanced planet than Venus is. So we come uh, through, let's see, how does he say that again? I want to get that exactly correct. Uh, he says, <clears throat> he comes therefore, that is the individual who's responding to the mutable, cross, the esoteric rulers of the mutable cross, he comes therefore through Venus under the power of mind, a higher type of mind than he's used before, mind of the uh, second and third subplanes of the higher mental plane especially, mind transmuted into wisdom uh, through the instrumentality of love. There is no wisdom without the heart. 
uh, if the mind alone is involved and the heart is not involved, we do not have wisdom. So when you are searching for wisdom, seeking for wisdom, seek to ponder on something uh, through the activation of your heart. And not only will your relationship to that something become illumined, but it will become wise due to the activation of the love energy. Then he comes uh, under. Uh, he comes, therefore, through the moon under the bondage of form. In order through form, experience to achieve release and the uplift of matter in Vulcan. Well, if we were to look at Moon and Vulcan, um, we could uh, divide their influences in the following way. The Moon is that uh, non-sacred planet which has most to do with the dense outer form of uh, gas, uh, liquid, and solid. So it's the dense physical uh, plane, particularly the dense physical body, and Vulcan has much to do with the etheric uh, energies. It is not devoid of influence upon the dense, uh, densest aspect of matter. It rules that as well, but it touches the etheric level. And through an increase of vibration in the etheric level, it uplifts the lower aspect of matter. Uh, if we uh, if, if we are subject to the five senses alone, we are truly bound to the outer form. We must begin to realize the presence of higher and higher vibrations. A Vulcan is the ruler of the systemic law of vibration and coming under the spiritual will of Vulcan and uh, the greater light, because in that light we shall see light, the greater light of Vulcan, we begin to experience the etheric uh, levels of expression. So there is, there is a need to uh, move from a dense physical preoccupation uh, into attention to the etheric plane. And as, the, as Vulcan stimulates the increasing frequency of matter, the ethers come uh, into view. Uh, this is, in a way, the effect of Vulcan at the top of the head upon Venus at the Ajna center. Uh, the, uh, vision of subtle matter. The assumption of the Virgin is involved here, the uplift of matter into the realm of the soul, the uplift of Virgo into the realm of the fire signs such as Leo representing the sun or the Christ uh, as represented by the sun. So matter is uplifted through increasing frequency and Vulcan, the spiritual will of Vulcan applying great pressure um, according to the law of the pump, as Master Moria calls it, uh, contributes to the up uplift of matter. He says the greater the downward pressure, the greater the corresponding uh, response upward. So if uh, the spiritual will exerts itself upon our psyche and our, uh, our, our matter, our energy system, there will be uh, at least the possibility, unless there's a total rebellion, at least the possibility of a uh, increasing in frequency uh, of the vibratory frequency of the material aspects of our nature. So, so Vulcan, um, very close to the sun, uh, related to the heart of the sun, related to the spiritual will and to Atma, uh, related to the, uh, the grip of the soul. And when we talk about a grip, we often talk, times talk about the second ray because I think, you know, the, the monadic rays of Vulcan, I think, are the fourth and the second. Initially, the sub-ray, the fourth, and finally, the second ray. It exerts that wrestling hold uh, upon matter. It forces it. It compels it. And um, uh, thereby brings out the latent light within it, you know, the dark light of matter. If you think about, um, if you think about the type of light which is related to the sign Cancer. We'll go over here to Esoteric Astrology. We'll go to page 329 and we will see uh, something said about Cancer and the Dark Light which gives us a hint about the Moon in relation to Vulcan. Remember the, the Moon often veils Vulcan, it veils Neptune, it can veil Uranus. Cancer, the light within the form. This is the diffused light of substance itself, 
the dark light of matter, dark light, referred to in the secret doctrine. It is the light awaiting the stimulation coming from soul light. Well, that soul light stimulation is operative uh, via Venus, and it's operative via Vulcan. Uh, Venus is a beautiful, lovely, supernal light. Vulcan adds intensity to that supernal light because it carries the first ray, the power of the spirit. So we have a Cancer, a very oh dim constellation as it appears from our Earth and our solar system because it was very uh, potent in earlier times, now dim, and symbolically representing the dimness of the light within matter which has to be brought to the fore. What it is, we have some incredible, powerful demonstrations such as in atomic energy when that dark light is brought to the fore and Vulcan is one of the main um, sources, uh, the, the main influences in bringing that type of light within matter to the fore so that it shines, so that it radiates, so that the halo is produced, so that uh, there is a light demonstration uh, in uh, the usual type of perceptions. Uh, in that uh, lesser light, we shall see greater light. So we do have the light of day, we do have the normal light which reveals uh, the input of the senses, and we will see an even greater light due to the influence of Vulcan. Uh, matter will become uh, increasingly radiant uh, under Uranus, under Vulcan, it's already happening. And when Vulcan is discovered and the spiritual will in humanity is activated, uh, we will have a more radiant uh, humanity, uh, stronger physical and etheric vehicles, more response, more endurance uh, response to the spiritual will. Okay, he comes therefore through the earth, ruler of esoteric ruler of Sagittarius, under the influence of planetary experience, which is different to individual experience, in order to transmute his personal consciousness into group awareness. Well, we uh, individual experience has a rather small ring pass knot. Uh, Dane Rudyard, the, the uh, fine uh, astrologer philosopher of the last century, he spoke very much of the planetarization of consciousness. And a lot of this is achieved through an increasing etheric connection with the etheric vehicles of uh, many other human beings and other forms of life. Uh, the kingdoms themselves, uh, the lesser kingdoms and some of the greater, will form part of this uh, understanding of planetary experience. And the Ahamkaric uh, ring pass knot will be gradually expanded until we have a true uh, group awareness. Uh, the, the, the etheric body is very important in the producing of uh, in the producing of group awareness. And the etheric body uh, is much stimulated in Sagittarius by the Earth. As I said before, you know, the Sagittarians are really trying to increase the vitality of the human unit through uh, spiritual, physical disciplines, yoga, through exercise, and so forth, uh, to vitalize the pursuit of the higher streams of energy. You have to have a strong body to do that, and the Earth represents the strengthening of the etheric body. Uh, so it says here, through many impacts due to experience on Earth, our personal consciousness is transmuted into group awareness. Our tiny little ring pass knot starts to expand. We begin to identify through our travels, through our speculations, through our visions, with the more and more of the lives found upon our Earth. And we come uh, into that state of mind which is planetarized. You know, I, I sometimes refer to Sagittarius as possessing the national geographic consciousness, you know, the willingness to go into all kinds of new environments and experience what they are, and, and, and to touch them, not just read about them, not just, you know, sort of armchair philosophy, but to actually go etherically into the change of energy. This is the earth in Sagittarius leading to uh, the increase of planetary experience and the uh, expansion of the personal consciousness until it comes to that state where one is beginning to include the various kingdoms, the animal, vegetable, vegetable, mineral, and of course the human, and also the kingdom of souls. 
all of these experienced etherically. Okay, uh, so uh, he comes as well, therefore, through Pluto under the destroying power of death. Pluto and death are equivalent, but it depends, you know, if you are on the mutable cross as an ordinary person, death is one thing. If you're on the mutable cross as a probationary disciple or disciple, death is something else. So the destroying power of death, what is destroyed? Limitation is destroyed. It's not life that is destroyed. Life can never be uh, destroyed. A knot can take or touch that life. Um, <clears throat> so it is uh, uh, obscurations which are destroyed, interestingly, by this occult planet of obscurity. Many contradictions in Pluto. It seems to take us down into the realm of the invisible where things are no longer seen, like, you know, who sees Hades? Who sees that which is hidden? Who sees that which is buried? And yet it is a planet of great revelation as well. Through Pluto, uh, we come then under the destroying power of death, death of desire. That happens particularly at the uh, second initiation. It's not that desire per se is destroyed, because you can't. It's a cosmic principle. But low desire can be destroyed and desire for that which uh, belongs to the dense physical body of the solar logos, so that can be destroyed. E even the desire for causal living, living in the egoic body, as the rich young man desired, even that can be destroyed and will be destroyed. So the death of desire, particularly uh, climaxing uh, in a certain mode at the second initiation, the death of the personality, and, I, and I, you know, uh, that real death, I think, is a fourth degree issue. The death of the personality, and I think that Pluto is much involved at the fourth degree, and of all which holds him between the pairs of opposites. He's a disciple. He's neither identified entirely with the personality nor entirely with the soul on his own plane. Uh, but uh, gradually, uh, he will move uh, towards achieving the final uh, liberation. Uh, the fact that Pluto will cut the thread that binds his consciousness via desire to the lower worlds. This is very much what uh, the Buddha did, if you think about it. The Buddha, uh, at, at least uh, tradition tells us, was born at the full moon in Taurus and therefore had the Scorpio uh, moon, which activated Pluto and helped him uh, teach, or for first, first achieve a great detachment. Now, I have a feeling that the true Buddha who had already been for 2,500 years the head of the spiritual hierarchy and not the Prince Gautama, uh, the, the true Buddha was achieving a detachment from the five lower worlds, whereas the uh, disciple Gautama, probably achieving the fourth initiation, was achieving a great renunciation and detachment from the lower three worlds. This is my ongoing theory, as I've explained for various reasons. You know, every head of the hierarchy lasts for 2,500 years, and there's no way that one who had been the head of the hierarchy ever since 3000 BC, approximately the death of Krishna, would be off searching in the woods for enlightenment. <laughs> this is more. This is this is more the third degree initiate looking for uh, liberation from the human kingdom. That is more what Gautama himself would have done, in my impression. In other words, as I've said before, that Christ is to Jesus as the Buddha was to Gautama. Uh, DK doesn't write about this, but uh, so far this is holding up in, in terms of my logic at least, and if, if I'm proven incorrect, then so be it, but for the moment this is the theory that I am entertaining. Okay, so he comes therefore through Pluto under the destroying power of death. It's a bit like the sixth formula in which uh, death itself is destroyed, the sixth formula in Discipleship of the New Age, Volume 2. Death of the personality, not only is its ancient domination ended, its ancient authority, but it is dispersed, just as the causal body is dispersed. The two are really closely related. The personality is what it is, and the causal body, the egoic lotus, is what we might call the trans personality, and that too is dispersed at the time of the fourth degree. And all that holds in between the pairs of opposites, but the solar angels will be liberated back to the heart of the sun and to the central spiritual sun, and then man, at least uh, as a fourth kingdom being, will achieve his final liberation. Of course, uh, man also extends to the fifth degree, 
but not to the sixth. Now, here is a very important sentence. Pluto or death, they are equivalent, never destroys the consciousness aspects. Pluto, uh, I say here, destroys the impediments to wider and deeper consciousness. Thus, Pluto clears the way for Jupiter, which signifies that wider and deeper consciousness. Uh, we have things going in two directions. We move from Jupiter to Pluto and Pluto to Jupiter. When we move from Jupiter to Pluto, we move from uh, uh, the bondage uh, that exists between soul and personality into the liberation of the soul and the liberation of the spirit under Pluto. Uh, when uh, we have Pluto uh, as the first member, when we move towards Jupiter, that death leads to a triadal and even monadic consciousness represented by Jupiter. Uh, just because uh, we have Jupiter as the orthodox ruler of Pisces does not mean that it cannot function in very high ways, monadic ways, with respect to this sign. Remember, I leave the Father's home and turning back I save. That's very much Jupiter in Pisces, isn't it? And, uh, of course, Jupiter in Virgo is there too for the redemption and the uplift of matter through an act of great generosity which Jupiter rules as well, large S. Okay, now we've reached uh, page 128. We'll see how far we get to go. Six planets, therefore, govern the mutable cross as far as humanity is concerned. Well, um, yeah, there's the mutable cross in relation to the planetary logos, in relation, which would include hierarchical rulers, and the mutable cross in relation to the solar logos and so forth. These crosses are great uh, uh, nexi of energy, and they don't apply to humanity alone, but as far as humanity is concerned, the uh, orthodox ruler and the esoteric rulers, those are the important ones. The hierarchical rulers, they do concern the very advanced human being, but not humanity, as DK, I think, appears to discuss him here. So six planets, and this is in itself significant. The DK will now describe the number six, for six is the number of the great work of the period of manifestation. The period of manifestation, in a way, is not just the period in which man is incarnating, but has to do with the entire monadic pilgrimage. Uh, whoa, okay, let's see if something, your audio connection has been lost. Okay, um, Okay, the audio connection is lost. Uh, we have to stop this for just a moment and see if we can improve upon the situation. 